The Golden Doom by Lord Dunsany. Two sentries pace to and fro and then halt, one on either side of the great door. The day is deadly sultry. I would that I were swimming down the Gaetian on the cool side under the fruit tree. It is like to thunder and fall of a dynasty. It will grow cool by nightfall. Where is the king? He rose in his golden barge with ambassadors or whispers with captains concerning future wars. The stars spare him. Why'd you say the stars spare him? Because if a doom from the stars falls suddenly on a king, it swallows up his people and all things round about him and his palace falls and the walls of his city and citadel and the apes come in from the woods and a large beast from the desert so that you would not say that a king had been there at all. But why should a doom from the stars fall on a king? Because he seldom placates them. I've heard that said of him. Who are the stars? That a man should scorn them. Should they that rule the thunder, the plague, the earthquakes, withhold these things save for much prayer? Always ambassadors are with the king, and his commanders come in from the distant lands, perfect of cities and makers of laws but never the price of the stars. Hark, is that thunder? Believe me, the stars are angry. Enter a stranger. He wanders towards the king's door, gazing about him. Go back. Why? It is death to touch the king's door. I am a stranger from Thessaly. It is death, even for a stranger. Your door is strangely sacred. Stranger wanders off. Enter two children, hand in hand. I want to see the king to pray for a hoop. I cannot open it. Will it do as well if I pray to the king's door? Yes, quite as well. He turns to talk to the other sentry. Is there anyone in sight? Nothing but a dog, and he's far out on the plain. Then we can take a while and eat bash. King's door, I want a little hoop. The sentries take a little bash between finger and thumb from pouches and put that wholly forgotten drug to their lips, leaving the children unattended by the door. My father is a taller soldier than that. My father can write. He taught me. Ho! Oh, writing frightens nobody. My father is a soldier. I have a lump of gold. I found it in the stream that runs down to Gaishan. I have a poem. I found it in my own head. Is it a long poem? No, but it would have been. Only there were no more rhymes for Sky. What is your poem? I saw a purple bird go up against the sky and it went up and up and round about did fly I saw it die that doesn't scan oh that doesn't matter do you like my poem birds aren't purple my bird was oh oh you don't like my poem yes I do no you don't you think it horrid no I don't yes you do Why didn't you say you liked it? It is the only poem I ever made. I do like it, I do like it. You don't, you don't. Don't be angry. I'll write it on the door for you. You'll write it? Yes, I can write it. My father taught me. I'll write it out with my lump of gold. It makes a yellow mark on the iron door. Oh, do write it. I would like to see it written like real poetry. You see, we'll be fighting again soon. Only a little war 
We never have more than a little war with the hill folk. When a man goes to fight, the curtains of the gods wax thicker than ever before between his eyes and the future. He may go to a great or to a little war. There can only be little war with the hill folk. Yet sometimes the gods laugh. At whom? At kings. Why have you grown uneasy about this war in the hills? Because the king is powerful beyond any of his fathers. And there's more fighting men, more horses and wealth than could have ransomed his father and his grandfather and dowered their queens and daughters. And every year his miners bring him more from the opal mines and from the turquoise quarries. He has grown very mighty then he will more easily crush the hill folk in a little war. When kings grow very mighty, the stars grow very jealous. I've written your poem. Oh, have you really? Yes, I'll read it to you. I saw a purple bird go up against the sky, and it went up and up and round about did fly. I saw it die. It doesn't scan. That doesn't matter. That man frightens me. He's only one of the king's spies. But I don't like the king's spies. They frighten me. Come on, then we'll run away. Go away. Go away. The king is coming. He will eat you. The boy throws a stone at the sentry and runs out. Now enters a spy who walks up to the door, and another spy who notices the door. He examines it and utters an owl-like whistle. The second comes back. They don't speak. Both whistle. All examine the door. Enter the king and his chamberlain. The king wears a purple robe. The sentries smartly transfer their spears to their left hands and return their right arms to their right sides. They then lower their spears until their points are within an inch of the ground, at the same time raising their right hands above their heads. They stand for some moments thus, then they lower their right arms to their right sides, at the same time raising their spears. In the next motion, they take their spears into their right hands and lower the butts to the floor, where they were before, the spears slanting forward a little. Both sentries move together precisely. The first spy runs forward towards the king and kneels, abasing his forehead to the floor. Something has been written on the iron door. On the iron door? Some fool has done it. Who has been here since yesterday? The first sentry shifts his hands a little higher on his spear, bringing the spear to his side and closes his heels all in one motion. He then takes one pace backwards with his right foot. Then he kneels on his right knee. When he has done this, he speaks. Nobody, Majesty, but a stranger from Thessaly. Did he touch the iron door? No, Majesty. He tried to, but we drove him away. How near did he come? Nearly to our spears, Majesty. What was his motive in seeking to touch the iron door? I don't know, Majesty. Which way did he go? That way, Majesty. An hour ago. The king whispers with one of his spies who stoops down and examines the ground I and steals away. Plenty, sacrifice to the gods, have I not? The sentry rises. What does this writing say? We cannot read, Majesty. A good spy should know everything. We watch, Majesty, and we search out, Majesty. We read shadows, we read footprints, and whispers in secret places. But we do not read writing. The king turns to his chamberlain. See what it is. The chamberlain goes up and reads the door. Hmm. 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 It is treason, Majesty. Read it. I saw a purple bird go up against the sky, and it went up 
and up and round about did fly. I saw it die. The stars have spoken. Has anybody been here but the stranger from Thessaly? No, Majesty. You saw nothing? Nothing but a dog far out on the plain and the children of the guard at play. And you? Nothing, Majesty. That is strange. It is a secret warning. It is treason. It is from the stars. No, no, Majesty. Not from the stars. Not from the stars. Some man has done it. Yet the thing should be interpreted. Shall I send for the prophet of the stars? Find me some prophet of the stars. I fear that we may go no more, my Chamberlain, along the winding ways of unequalled Zerakon, nor play Derui with the golden balls. I have thought more of my people than of the stars, and more of Zerakon than of Windy Heaven. Believe me, Majesty, some idle man has written it and passed by. Your spies shall find him, and then his name will soon be forgotten. Yes, yes, perhaps you are right. Though the sentries saw no one, no doubt some beggar did it. Yes, Majesty, some beggar has surely done it. But look, here come two prophets of the stars. They shall tell us that this is idle. Enter two prophets and a boy attending them. Some beggar has written a rhyme on the iron gate, and as the ways of rhyme are known to you, I desired you, rather as poets than as prophets, to say whether there was any meaning in it. Tis but an idle rhyme. The first prophet examines the writing. Come hither, servant, those that serve the stars. Bring hither our golden cloaks, for this may be a matter for rejoicing. And bring our green cloaks also, for this may tell of young new beautiful things, with which the stars will one day gladden the king. And bring our black cloaks also, for it may be a doom. Exit the boy. The prophet goes up to the door and reads solemnly. The stars have spoken. Re-enter, attendant with cloaks. I tell you, some beggar has done it. It is written in pure gold. He dons the black cloak over his body and head. What do the stars mean? What warning is it? I cannot say. Come then, you, and tell us what the warning is. The second prophet makes his way to the door. The stars spoken. He too cloaks himself in black. What is this? What does it mean? We do not know, but it is from the stars. It is a harmless thing. There is no harm in it, Majesty. Why should not birds die? Why have the prophets covered themselves in black? They are a secret people and looking for inner meanings. There is no harm in it. They have covered themselves in black. They have not spoken of any evil things. They have not spoken of it. If the people see the prophets covered in black, they will say that the stars are against me and believe that my luck has turned. The people must not know. Some prophet must interpret to us the doom. Let the chief prophet of the stars be sent for. Summon the chief prophet of the stars that looks on Zerakon. The chief prophet of the stars. The chief prophet of the stars. I have summoned the chief prophet, Majesty. If he interprets this all right, I will put a necklace of turquoise round his neck with opals from the mines. He will not fail. He is a very cunning interpreter. What if he covers himself with a huge black cloak and does not speak and goes muttering away, slowly with bended head, till our fears spread to the sentries and they cry out loud. This is no doom from the stars, but some idle scribe has written it in his insolence upon the iron door, wasting his hoard of gold. 
Not for myself I have a fear of doom. Not for myself, but I inherited a rocky land, windy and ill-nurtured, and nursed to its prosperity by years of peace, and spread its boundaries by years of war. I have brought up harvests out of barren acres, and given good laws unto naughty towns, and my people are happy, and lo, the stars are angry. It is not the stars, it is not the stars, Majesty, for the prophets of the stars have not interpreted it. Indeed, it was only some reveler wasting his gold. Enter the chief prophet of the stars that look on Zerikon. Chief prophet of the stars that look on Zerikon, I would have you interpret the rhyme upon yonder door. He goes up to the door and reads it. It is from the stars. Interpret it, and you shall have great turquoises round your neck, with opals from the mines of the frozen mountains. The chief prophet cloaks himself in a great black cloak. Who should wear purple in a land but a king? Or who would go up against the sky but he who has troubled the stars by neglecting their ancient worship? Such a one has gone up and up, increasing power and wealth. Such a one has soared above the crowns of those that went before him. Such a one the stars have doomed. The undying ones, the illustrious. Who wrote it? It is pure gold. Some god has written it. Some god? Some god whose home is the undying stars. Last night I saw a star go flaming earthward. Is this a warning or is this a doom? The stars have spoken. It is then a doom. They speak not in jest. I have been a great king, let it be said of me. The stars overthrew him, and they sent a god for his doom. For I have not met my equals amongst kings, that man should overthrow me. And I have not oppressed my people, that man should rise up against me. It is better to give worship to the stars than to do good to man. It is better to be humble before the gods than proud in the face of your enemy, though we do evil. Let the stars hearken yet, and I will sacrifice a child to them. I will sacrifice a girl child to the twinkling stars, and a male child to the stars that blink not, the stars of the steadfast eye. Let a boy and a girl be bought for sacrifice. Will you accept this sacrifice to the gods that the stars have sent? They say that the gods love children. I may refuse no sacrifice to the stars, nor to the gods who send them. Make ready the sacrificial knives. Is it fitting that a sacrifice take place by the iron door where the gods from the stars has trod? Or must it be in a temple? Let it be offered by the iron door. Fetch hither the altar stone. Will this sacrifice avail to avert the doom? Who knows? I fear that even yet the doom will fall. It were wise to sacrifice some greater thing. What more can a man offer? His pride. What pride? Your pride that went up against the sky and troubled the stars. How shall I sacrifice my pride to the stars? It is upon your pride that the doom will fall and take away your kingdom. I will sacrifice my crown and reign uncrowned amongst you so that only I save my kingdom. If you sacrifice your crown, which is your pride, and if the stars accept it, perhaps the gods that they sent may avert the doom. 
and you may still reign in your kingdom, though humbled and uncrowned. Shall I burn my crown with spices and incense, or shall I cast it into the sea? Let it be laid here by the iron door, where the gods came who wrote the golden doom. When he comes again by night to shrivel up the city, or to pour an enemy in through the iron door, he will see your cast off pride, and perhaps accept it, and take it away to the neglected stars. Go after my spies and say that I make no sacrifice. Goodbye, my brittle glory. Kings have sought you. The stars have envied you. Even now, the sun has set. Who denies the stars? And the day is departed, wherein no god walks abroad. It is near the hour when the spirits roam the earth, and all things that go unseen, and the faces of the abiding stars, will soon be revealed to the fields. Lay your crown there, and let us come away. And let no man come near the door all night. Yes, Yes, Majesty. Majesty. It was your pride. Let it be forgotten. May the stars accept it. Exit the king. The stars have envied him. It is an ancient crown. He wore it well. May the stars accept it. If they do not accept it, what doom will overtake him? It will suddenly be as though there were never any cities of Zericho. Nor two sentries like you and me, standing before the door. How do you know? That is ever the way of the gods. But it is unjust. How should the gods know that? Will it happen tonight? Come, we must march away. The boy enters, crying. (laughs) King's door, King's door, I want my little hoop. Approaching the King's door, he sees a crown. Oh. He takes it up, puts it on the ground, and then attacks it mercilessly with the scepter. He exits. The great door opens. A fugitive spy slips out and sees the crown is gone. The gods have come. The gods have come. They run back through the door and the door is closed. It opens again, and the king and the chamberlain come through. The stars are satisfied.